Okay, in terms of the board, in terms of industry, where do you think more of the industry was in the South? Upper South or Lower South? Upper yeah, Upper South had more industry. Specifically, Kentucky has a pretty industry. Do you know what was one of the most industrial southern cities in the country? Louisville. Was Louisville, yeah. Especially with the transportation revolution, right? Um, Kentucky becomes, because of steamboats, a pretty um, um, active city industrially relative to the south, right? I mean, not compared to Pittsburgh, right? Or not compared to Buffalo or Cleveland, but compared to other parts of the south. Um, really, Louisville and then actually Birmingham had quite a bit of steel production later on. Um, okay, um, the Middle South. When we talk about the Middle South, we're talking about basically straight across here. Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and then also Virginia. And remember, one reason why we also take those to be the Middle South isn't just their geography, but also the cultural stuff that goes along with it, right? I mean, our, like my wife doesn't think Louisville's part of Kentucky. She doesn't think it's part of Kentucky. Not geographically. She understands that geographically Kentucky's inside, or Lowell's inside of Kentucky. What's your argument, do you think? It's not the same. Like, it's got a larger population. Yeah, culturally speaking, it's a lot different. In fact, she, before we, she really knew much about me, she thought that Northern Kentucky and Louisville were not part of Kentucky. They don't have accents. It's much different. And it turns out those are by far the two most diverse and two most Catholic places in the state. Um, but um, she says that culturally they're much different. Does she have a point that Louisville and Kentucky are culturally different than the rest of Kentucky? Yeah, she does. But you also have the argument that every state has different cultural pockets to it, right? Not just Kentucky. Although, why is Kentucky kind of weird, though? Why is Kentucky unique in this regard? Or in this instance? Kentucky literally is the last state before you get to the north, right? So northern Kentucky has some northern qualities to it, right? And down here has some real sort of deep south qualities to it. Hopkinsville is a good example of a, a, a county that's kind of deep southish, right? A much higher African American population. It's much more stratified economically. Um, a lot of the girls that leave there end up being sorority type girls, right? Like southern white girls um, in these places that go to big universities, sororities are really big deals, right? Um, that western Kentucky and central Kentucky, that's a bigger thing. Um, in northern Kentucky, it's more of a northern attitude, right? Even the accents are different, right? Right, the transient girls from like Boone County and Kent County and Scott County and boys and girls from there, they had more nasally type of almost northern like accents. I couldn't believe they were from Kentucky. And Lowell people have an accent, but Lowell accent is different than a Central Kentucky accent, right? Almost a non-accent, relatively speaking. Obviously, if you go to the north, they all think we're like it. When I lived in London, they thought I was basically dropped out of a hillbilly plantation. <laughs> um, and I don't think I have a very, very big accent at all. Um, but that's what, you know, compared to them. What about number of slaves? Relative to the north, more slaves or less slaves? More. Relative to the deep south. Less. What about industry? Less than the, the north and more than the south. Deep south. There you go. Isn't this kind of like the middle colonies? We're learning about the middle colonies. Um, it's similar to that. The middle south will also, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia, they actually will stay with the union even after Lincoln's um, election and won't leave until the Battle of Charleston. The original seven members of the Confederacy were all Deep South states, and the Middle South went along after the Battle of Charleston. They left the Union after the Battle of Charleston. Um, and then, obviously, the Lower South, the South South. This area here was called the Black Belt because of the very high percentage of African American slaves in the, in the Deep South. Even in the Deep South, a majority of white people did not have slaves. And by the way, where was the largest population of whites? Upper South or Lower South? Lower South. Upper South. Upper, Upper South, South had more white people. Lower South had more black people. Not necessarily more black people relative to whites, 
but uh, the population of white people was much was much more north. In fact, because remember, this is just real spread out land, right? The population spread out. In fact, during the Civil War, the fact that Missouri and Kentucky, who had very large white populations, stayed with the north was really bad for the South. In fact, Abraham Lincoln was, was quoted as saying, I pray to have God on my side, but I have to have Kentucky. That Kentucky was the lynch, linchpin for winning or losing the war. Who did that? Do what? Who did that? Lincoln. Um, okay. Um, 1,700 families, write this down just for your knowledge about the sort of economic stratification. 1,700 families, that's it, 1,700 families in the entire South owned more than 100 slaves, and that's it. 1,700, it basically was like an aristocracy, right? The South was much more aristocratic, not just in terms of economic stratification, but also sort of in like how they saw themselves relative to everybody else, right? Like, isn't there sort of a stereotype about how a rich plantation male acted, right? And a rich plantation female acted relative to their others around them? The life of the South was surrounded around plantation agriculture. Although most people didn't own a big plantation, the cultural and social life actually did kind of go around it, right? That was who had the money. If you were a big plantation owner, where was most of your wealth, though? Because in the North, you know, bankers had money, industrialists had money, right, cash. Where did the South have most of its money? Southern plantation owners. And slaves are in the ground, right? They owned large land, they owned a home, but theirs was more, they didn't have a lot of cash on hand. In fact, when Southern slave owners wanted to go buy something big, you know what they usually did? They usually had to sell slaves or sell land. Jefferson had to do this and complained about it a lot. And like, if he, his was particularly horrible. He knew how horrible the slave system was, but he also would sell family members of other people he knew to get cash. Okay, so let's talk about this aristocracy. Um, is this aristocracy particularly democratic? No. no. I mean, the whole definition of an aristocracy is particularly anathema to democracy anyway, right? That's why, by the way, during the war, European aristocracy, you think they were more pro-North or pro-South? Pro-South. They are more pro-South, right? More stifling democracy, right? The genteel nature that comes out of the plantation sort of social stereotype. By the way, the oh, this is a stereotype. A good example, by the way, remember I said that three times more people served for the North than served for the Confederacy? There are 75 Civil War monuments in Kentucky. 75. 73 of them are Confederate. We had three times more people fight for the North than for the South. But 97% of our monuments are Confederate. Why? Because we're just another state. Because we've, because we've rewritten our history, right? Have you heard people talking like, well, you know, they're just rewriting history. That's not how it really went down. The bad part is, original history was oftentimes written down poorly, right? Um, so a lot of the stereotypes we hear about the South was a genteel nature, and everyone was sort of sweet with, you know, sitting on the front porch drinking tea, looking really pretty, you know, with their gorgeous dresses and being waited on, and everyone's kind of nice with wonderful manners. That's kind of a big stereotype. Um... The slave system itself, I'll tell you, many of the men who owned slaves had tons of, do what? Nothing. What did you say? Nothing. You say babies? Yeah. Yes, that's what I was going with it. They okay. impregnated a lot of their slaves. They impregnated a lot of the slaves, and that became more slaves. Sexually speaking, um, slave women were always under duress from being raped by the plantation owner or from their sons. In fact, young men who were in the plantation um, agricultural system, right, like the men of the plantation owners, oftentimes would practice on slave women, and they wouldn't even count it. They would still consider themselves virgins, because the only people they had ever had sex with was a slave. Knocking these women up, and creating more slaves in the, in, the, in the meantime. Many African Americans today have in their blood 
a white slave owner who raped one of their um, ancestors. Yeah, he's talking about that's how he got his red hair. That's how he got his red hair. It's exactly right. Malcolm X was redheaded, right? His name was Red. Yeah. yeah. There's a reason why he hated white people. He's remember that's why he got rid of his last name Little, right? He wanted to erase the because many African Americans after the Civil War none of them had net last names. So what last name did they take? That of their slave owner, right? So Little was probably a slave owner's last name. And so he rejected that, and that's where he has the name X, and stand for where he thought he should have a last name. So many of us, like, you know how I always talk about being Irish, and a lot of you guys talk about being German or Scotch-Irish or whatever? You know where you came from, right? Well, if you're African-American, for most people, they know that they came from Africa, obviously, but you don't know where you came from, Right? I mean, Senegal and Angola are two very different places, right? East Africa and West Africa are very different places. You've been robbed of who you are, right? I mean, how much do you hear me get a kick out of being Irish and Catholic, right? It's part of who I am, right? Is it part of who you are, sort of where your family comes from? But we have a huge portion of this country that had that robbed from them because they don't know, right? And it was for economic reasons, right? There's been slavery all throughout history, right? The Bible had it. You know, we, we, in many civilizations, we've had it. In every continent, we've had it. But many historians have also said that American slavery is the worst form of it. Why do you think people consider American slavery to be so much worse? Well, I mean, maybe. I mean, like, South America and the West Indies had a larger population relative to whites. Okay, their identity was robbed. That's certainly part of it, right? Do what? Yeah, a lot of slavery, I mean, you know, like, for instance, remember when you would learn about, like, two, two armies would fight, and the losing army oftentimes would be put into slavery or servitude for a while. What happened with their kids? They just became citizens, right? Or, or even even, but this is it. This, for generations, you are now a slave. Right? And your kid's a slave. And your grandkid's a slave. And your great-grandkid's a slave. Just like your father was a slave. And your grandfather was a slave. And your great-grandfather was a slave. And what the, what's the whole purpose behind it? It's the purpose of slavery for the South. Well, that is, that's what, that's what happened. Economic gain. Right? What comes out of it is a feeling of inferiority. But isn't this all for money? Didn't we learn about that? What was the who were actually doing a lot of the work at first when the colony started? Indentured servants, but they became problematic, right? Bacon's Rebellion taught people that, and so they start bringing over slaves for economic reasons. And then the sense of inferiority comes into it. What if you've been told that you are dumb, and that your dad is dumb, and your grandfather's dumb, and your great grandfather's dumb, and your kids will be dumb, and that you are inferior to white people? If you've been told that over and over and over, where do you start believing? It's it's true. That that's the truth, right? And if you're a white person, and you hear that blacks are bad, and you've heard your dad say that, and your grandfather say that, and black people at the same time are sensing the same thing, what happens to the white frame of mind reference to black people? They internalize that too, right? So what starts off as an economic unfair, but still an economic relationship, becomes a social problem, right? So an unfair economic relationship turns into a nightmare of a social relationship. And then later, later eventually has ridiculous political ramifications called a civil war. The South will argue that the Civil War was about states' rights. Well, what was the one state right they wanted to have? Slavery. The right to have slavery, right? I mean, South can kind of dress it up however they want to, but in the end, slavery is the giant, fat, huge elephant in the one-bedroom apartment. Um, now, some slave owners said that having slaves was risky. Why would they say having slaves is economically risky? They could run away. 
they could die of disease, right? They could choose not to work. And one of the stereotypes is that um, a lot of slaves ran away. Do you know how most slaves got their freedom? They wasn't running away. They paid it off themselves. They paid it off themselves by working somewhere, right? In fact, most slaves, what evidence has taught us is that most slaves that have run away actually came back. Can you think of why slaves would come back to the place where they were a slave? When black people, when slaves were married, today when people are married, they say, until death do you part, right? Until death do us part. But in the slave system, they said, until death or distance do us part. What's that mean? If they get sold. Imagine a world, and, and think about your families, right? I'm sure your father likes you a little bit, Michaela, right? On some level, probably, right? I've, I've met your dad. He seems relatively fond of you. I know your mom's... I see you'd like it either way. She <laughs> looks just like you, so she has to like you a little bit. Um, I said you look like her. Imagine if your family was torn apart. Right? Let's say that one of you was on this farm and another one was on a farm over here. Is it inconceivable to think your father or mother would escape to come see you for a couple days every now and again? Does that seem rational? And so what oftentimes happened, people who escaped actually came back. They just went to go see their family and came back. It would cover for them. Does that make sense? People tend to think that slaves were running away all the time. Right? Running to freedom. That didn't, that didn't happen as much as you think it did. Yeah. Did Harriet Tubman ever come back? Or did she stay away? Harriet Tubman is, a, is, is an interesting case. Um, the Underground Railroad is really cool because it's symbolically pretty awesome, right? The freedom movement. Harriet Tubman came back a million times, not to visit family, but to get people out. In fact, when she went to talk, we'll talk about this actually probably maybe tomorrow. Um, but. Um, but when Harriet Tubman came back, she came back. First of all, she was actually a spy in the Civil War for the North. But um, when she came back, she came back armed. And this is the thing that's really cool with the Underground Railroad not, and freeing yourself. Not that, I mean, hiding in the house and stuff is kind of a cool idea, right? Kind of romantic in the sense that people are you know, giving themselves up in case for this higher cause. Sort of like people during the Holocaust who hid Jewish people, right? But this is what, when you were leaving with Harriet Tubman, she told you that you are no longer a slave. And the reason is, it's because you're either going to be free or you're going to go down dying. Right? You're not going back. Either you're dying or you're gaining freedom. So in the end, at what point do you become a non-slave? The second you decide to leave. Right? The second you decide that you're going to leave, then you are no longer a slave. The second you take that first step and you make the decision that either you're going to gain freedom or you're going to die, you're no longer a slave. Does that make sense? And that's one of the things that was sort of um, intellectually interesting about the way Harry Tubman did this, is that you had to, it, was, it was all in, right? It wasn't like, well, I'll try and see how this works and then we go back and it's not. You're all in. Um, so she did go back, but not like to go back and stay. She left and came to people and took back off. Okay. Um, there's also a debate about whether or not slave owners were really that mean to their slaves. Because the, the, um, the argument of the apologists was, what would be a reason why slave owners wouldn't be that mean to their slaves? Yeah, since they're an economic investment, you don't want to hurt your investment, right? By keeping them, by killing them, or, or, or keeping them from being productive. But what's the opposite argument? What is, an, what is evidence that they probably could have been very brutal? Well, then first of all, what do you think slave owners, specifically large slave owners, lived in constant fear of? Revolt. Revolt, right, or rebellion. So therefore, what's way, one way to keep rebellion from ever happening? Yeah, absolute fear and physical domination, right? And when someone does try something, what do you do? You make an example of them. You let everyone see what you do, what you do to them. 
What's the time? 20. Oh dear. 